When we concluded our previous episode on the history of the Maya Classic period, the city of Kalakmul was the premier city-state of the Maya lowlands, and its influence was unrivaled. Through savvy diplomacy and a well-oiled military machine, Kalakmul had managed to contain its main rival, Tikal. Beyond the Paten, new powers were rising in the west and east, and new dynasties were being founded. There's going to be glorious rises, painful falls, and never a dull moment. The late classic represents the full flowering of classic Maya culture, and many of the most famous buildings, monuments, and works of art were created during this time. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. It's about time we took a look at one of the most famous Maya cities during its heyday, one that you're probably familiar with, Palenque. We already encountered Palenque in part one, but just to recap, Palenque developed into a regional power during the 4th and 5th centuries. Unfortunately, it found itself a target of Kalak Mul in 599 and 611. This was very unfortunate timing because the dynasty at Palenque appears to have been in crisis. To chronicle this, we need to turn the clock back to the beginning of the 6th century, at the end of the reign of Akal Monab I. This man's rule at the city was pretty uneventful, although later records accord him an unusual prominence in the history of the dynasty. Future reverence aside, when Akal Monab I died in 524, there was a five-year gap between him and his successor, Ka'an Hoi Chitam I, which is a bit suspicious. Ka'an Hoi Chitam I would rule for 36 years, and when he died, he was followed by a series of distressingly short reigns. His immediate successor, Akhal Monab II, possibly the grandson of Akhal Monab I, only ruled for five years before his brother or half-brother, Ka'an Pahlam I, ascended and ruled for another 11 years. When he died, he did not leave a viable male heir, and so Palenque installed its first queen, Lady Yol Iknal in 583. She may have been a sister or daughter of Ka'an Bahlam I, but we can't be certain. It's during her reign in 599 that Kalakmul attacked. The inscriptions at Palenque that record this event say that Palenque's trio of patron gods were thrown down. Whether this is a metaphorical or literal account of the desecration of their idols isn't certain. Lady Yol Iknal died in 604 and was succeeded by a man who was most likely her son, Ahen Yol Mat. While he appears to have had some success in imposing control on Palenque's smaller nearby neighbors, he could not prevent Kalakmul's second catastrophic attack in 611. Although Ahen Yol Mat survived the onslaught, he died the following year, one might imagine as a broken man. This threw the Palenque dynasty into chaos because Ahen Yol Mat does not appear to have left an heir. In 613, one year after his death, we get a poignant lament of what was going on at the city. An inscription reads, Lost is the divine lady and lost is the divine lord, before noting that certain key rituals were not performed. The ruler at this time is said to be a Muan Mat, which is a very interesting name. Some of you sharp-eared viewers may recall that name from part one, because it's the same as the ancestral deity and founder of Palenque's trio of patron gods. It's possible that this may not have been a conventional reign, or may represent an interregnum. Whatever it was, it didn't last long, because in 615, a new king was crowned, Kenich Hanab Pakal, the 12-year-old son of Lady Sak Kauk. There's actually some speculation that Lady Sakka'uk may have been Muan Mat, but the gender of this ruler is male, so most scholars consider this to be unlikely. Pakal's inauguration is beautifully captured on this tablet, where his mother presents him with a crown. Since he was not officially installed as a lord immediately, it's likely that Lady Sakka'uk acted as regent for her young son during the early years of his reign. I've always wondered if Pakal's elevation was done out of desperation, or if the Palenque elites actually saw something promising in this kid. Things may have looked bleak at Palenque, but early doubters of Kenich Hanab Pakal would be proven wrong. Though not immediately successful, Pakal would become one of the most pivotal rulers at Palenque. 
An early setback for the city came in 628 when the king of Piedras Negras attacked Palenque and was able to capture a high-ranking noble. By this point, Pakal was 25 and married, and after this incident, he devoted himself to rebuilding Palenque's prestige. Although Piedras Negras would continue to be a rival under the reign of Kitnich Yonal Ak I, they appear to have diverted their attention to other cities such as Sakti and would not seriously threaten Palenque for the remainder of Pakal's reign. This gave him plenty of time to indulge the builder inside of him. His most notable constructions were a major expansion of the Olvidado, the main palace at the site, and the iconic Temple of the Inscriptions. Many monuments from Pakal's reign survive, and they detail a remarkable recovery of the city. Between 659 and 663, Palenque launched campaigns against several small neighboring cities. The captives of these conflicts are immortalized on the walls of the palace. The most noteworthy is Nun Ujol Chak from the city of Santa Elena, a former Palenque vassal that Pakal would bring back under control. Although some of these gains were short-lived, they do show that Palenque was now a force that could not be ignored. Pakal finally died on August 28, 683, after having ruled an astonishing 68 years. However, Pakal is best known to us because in 1949, his tomb below the Temple of the Inscriptions was discovered intact and undisturbed. His sarcophagus lid and jade death mask are among the most famous works of Maya art in the world. Pakal's reign was nothing short of a glittering triumph. They don't call him Pakal the Great for nothing. Even though his propaganda may take some liberties, it's worth noting that at the end of the day, he preserved Palenque's independence. We've seen plenty of cities go dark after some political catastrophe or conquest put them under another city's yoke. Pakal was able to navigate the crisis and rebuild Palenque. Not only did he leave behind a restored and reinvigorated city, but a very capable heir in his son, Ketnich Ka'an Bahlam II. Ka'an Bahlam II was 48 when he ascended, and I like to think that he spent his time waiting for the chance to prove himself, because he did not disappoint. His first item of business was to oversee his father's burial, and he wouldn't officially ascend until January the following year. Like his father, he continued to channel the city's massive wealth to continue its building spree. It's Ka'an Bahlam that we have to thank for the entire cross group at Palenque, which includes the Temple of the Cross, the Temple of the Sun, and the Temple of the Foliated Cross. These are often considered among the finest examples of Maya art and architecture that celebrate Palenque's historic and mythical past and tie it into the grander cosmological narrative. The most famous and striking portraits of Ka'an Bahlam come from those temples. Besides the ambitious building program, Ka'an Bahlam also struck against Palenque's neighbors with initial success. In September 687, he successfully attacked the city of Tony Na, and judging from the sudden disappearance of Tony Na's ruler too, the attack may have proved fatal for him. Judging from this portrait, Kanich Ka'an Bahlam II was not a man that you'd want to find yourself on the wrong side of. He would also pry the site of Moral Reforma away from Kalakmul patronage and even installed a new king there in 690. Records also indicate that Palenque's control even extended as far as Lamar, practically on the doorstep of Piedras Negras. Although these fortunes didn't last very long, it's crazy to think that less than a century earlier, Palenque had been the neighborhood punching bag. For a brief moment, it would be the dominant power in the West. As we'll see in the next chapter, a new rival would emerge in the West and present a serious challenge for Palenque. Kanich Ka'an Bahlam II would finally pass away on February 16, 702, and be succeeded by his brother, Kanich Ka'an Hoi Chitam II, later that year. It's worth noting that Ka'an Bahlam II was not succeeded by a son, but by his brother. Either he had had no sons, or they predeceased him in death. The reign of Kanich Ka'an Hoi Chitam II the last son of Pakal the Great, would represent the end of Palenque's golden age, because out in the West, trouble was brewing. Now let's take a look at the wider Western Maya world. Palenque's rebirth was not the only thing happening out there. It was actually a pretty hot area as a whole, and was marked by some intense rivalries and conflicts. We've already gotten a glimpse of this with Palenque's history, but let's take a look at some of the other players. Along with Palenque in the Chiapas Highlands, there was Tony Na, who was developing into a major rival for Palenque. To the east, on the Usamacinta River, was Piedras Negras, and further upstream, the nearby city and rival of Piedras Negras, Yashilan. Let's start at Piedras Negras. 
During the 7th century, records of Piedras Negras become much better, and we actually have a full king list from 603 onwards. That year marks the ascension of Kenich Yonal Ach I. He would be a revered ruler at the city, and his inaugural niche motif would be emulated by his successors. He also styled himself as a warrior king, complete with Teotihuacano gear. We actually met him briefly during the last chapter when he carried out a successful attack on Palenque in 628 and captured a noble from the city. In 637, he prosecuted a successful war against Saxi and even captured its ruler. All in all, he was a very successful war leader who was able to establish control over much of the upper Usamacinta River. Kenich Yonal Ach I died in 639 and was succeeded by his 12-year-old son, the gloriously named Ruler II. I'm not the guy who comes up with these names. Like his father, he styled himself as a Teotihuacano warrior. We know from his monuments that the city still had wide regional control. In this image from Ruler II's reign, a Piedras Negras king is shown receiving the submission of lords from Yashitlan, Bonampak, and Lakanha. We also know that Piedras Negras was providing assistance to Kalak Mool because one Piedras Negras noble is noted to have been in the service of Yuknom the Great, but the exact relations of these two cities remain obscure. Piedras Negras' dominance would begin to wane under their next ruler, Kenich Yonal Ach II. During his reign, Toninan and Palenque were on the rise, but perhaps the best signal of Piedras Negras' shifting fortunes was the resurgence of Yashitlan. When we last spoke of Yashitlan, their ruler, not I Jaguar I, was captured by Piedras Negras, which resulted in Yashitlan getting turned into a vassal. Things at Yashitlan went a little quiet for the next century or so, and the records are sparse, likely due to its subjugation by Piedras Negras. The history at Yashitlan comes back into focus with Yashun Bachlam III, who ascended sometime in 629. He is mentioned retrospectively, and these inscriptions are widely believed to be part of an agenda to legitimize the ruler who came after him, Itzam Na Bachlam III. Under his rule from 681 to 742, Yashitlan would finally cast off the yoke of Piedras Negras. If you're curious about how Piedras Negras allowed this to happen, they were going through a bit of a succession crisis because Kenich Yohnal Ach II does not appear to have had any surviving sons and had to pass his throne to the husband of his daughter, and a lot of his energy was spent legitimizing her claim. It was a bit of a mess. He did manage to seize a Yashitlan Sahal in 726, but appears to have had no further success in bringing the city to heel. During that time, Itzamna Bachlam spent his reign asserting Yashitlan's independence by capturing several neighboring rulers of minor cities. He continued campaigning into his 70s, though by that point it's likely that his generals and nobles were leading the troops. His long reign saw these victories commemorated in several building projects. However, his most famous building is probably Temple 23. This building was dedicated to his principal wife, Lady Ka'abal Shuk. She was shown great honor by her husband and played an important role in his reign. We can see this detailed in these famous lintels, which are widely considered to be masterpieces of Maya art. They recount a bloodletting ritual in which she conjures a warrior from the Boots Chan and prepares her husband for battle. This building shows that Itzam Na Bahlam placed great emphasis on honoring his wife, her connection to the gods and ancestors, and her associated rituals. It's also worth noting that this structure would be the burial place of Itzam Na Bahlam and Lady Shuk. After decades spent revitalizing his city, he passed away in 742, just shy of 62 years on the throne. And now for some family drama, because as it turns out, Lady Ka'bal Shuk was not Itzam Na Bahlam's only wife. Two other wives are recorded, Lady Sakbiyan and a princess from Kalak Mool, Lady Ik Skull but she's also popularly known as Lady Evening Star. Upon his death, a succession crisis appears to have ensued because there's a 10-year gap between his death and the next king's ascension. It's possible that some of the king's heirs predeceased him. He did live into his 90s, after all. However, interesting evidence at Piedras Negras paints a different picture. A panel dated to 749 depicts a Yashitlan ruler named Yopat Bahlam II attending a Khatun celebration at Piedras Negras, and references an ascension under Piedras Negras' auspices. The accompanying inscription also notes that Yopat Bahlam II was a grandson of Yashun Bahlam III. 
The fact that there's zero record of this guy, Yashitlan, is a little suspicious, and it makes me wonder if Piedras Negras may have been backing a contender to the Yashitlan throne, or if he was later erased from Yashitlan's history by a rival. Regardless, Yopat Bachlam II dropped out of visibility really fast, and by 752, there was a new king in town, and he would continue Itzamna Bachlam III's legacy. On April 29, 752, Yashun Bachlam IV ascended and would leave a lasting mark on Yashitlan. His origins are very interesting because while he was the son of Itzamna Bachlam III, he was not the son of Lady Ka'bal Shuk, but instead that of Lady Ikskal. By the time he was born, his father Itzamna Bachlam was already in his early 60s. This probably meant that he was a minor claimant for most of his life, and that insecurity really shines because he dedicated a lot of energy to justifying his rule. His monuments show him participating in ceremonies with his late father, and they also elevate his mother to a similarly important ritual functionary to that of Lady Ka'abal Shuk. There's also evidence that Yashun Bachlam undertook a rewriting of Yashitlan history because several monuments were repaired or repurposed while others were covered up. Like his own father, Yashun Bachlam also gave high prominence to his wives, and they appear in a lot of art from his reign. But when he wasn't obsessing over his legacy or legitimacy, he was engaging in an energetic reign of building and warfare. One of his favorite titles that pops up in inscriptions is He of Twenty Captives. Among notable captives were Sahals from Santa Elena, Sanab Huke, and La Pasadita. Now, if you ever go to Yashitlan today and behold its ruins, you're basically looking at the city that Yashun Bachlam IV built. He leveled the main plaza to tie the central precinct together, and is probably the person who commissioned Yashitlan's famous Temple 33 with its distinct roof comb. However, the new great power in the West was Tony Na. A late bloomer of the classic period, Tony Na has long been looked down upon by some scholars as a rather Spartan city among the jewels of the Maya world. And while they certainly were a war-loving bunch, they could and did celebrate their victories and their rulers with beautiful monuments. During the late 7th century, Tony Na and Palenque would fight for control of the modern Lacandon region. Palenque's king, Ka'an Bachlam II, had early success against Tony Na. In September 687, he successfully attacked the city, which may have resulted in the death of Tony Na's ruler too. Despite that setback, Tony Na would get their revenge under ruler II's successor, Kanich Baknal Chak, whose retaliation against Palenque crescendoed in a successful Star War in 692. He would memorialize these victories against Palenque in a series of monuments at Tony Na. A favorite motif of these monuments is the display of bound captives beneath the ruler. The inscriptions on these monuments cheekily refer to Palenque's Ka'an Bachlam as Ach Pitzal, the ball player, which was apparently one of his childhood nicknames. What a burn! By the time of Kanich Bachnal's death, Tony Na had become a bona fide powerhouse in the West. Now things at the city got really interesting because after his death, he left a two-year-old boy as his heir, the aptly named Ruler Four. Now, this kid might seem like a total pushover to us, and that's completely understandable. He probably wasn't even potty trained. But if any other cities or rivals thought so too, they would be surprised. As it turns out, Ruler 4 had two powerful and experienced lieutenants acting as regents, and they continued the wars. In 711, they achieved a stunning victory over Palenque, which resulted in the capture of its ruler, Ka'an Hoi Chitam II. The artists at Tony Na didn't miss the chance to sculpt a captured and humiliated Ka'an Hoi Chitam for posterity, and this work has survived to today. Now you may be thinking that Ruler 4 and his regents had this poor guy executed, and while that is possible, it's probably not what happened to him because Ka'an Hoi Chitam is recorded participating at ceremonies at Piedras Negras in 714 and 718. This would suggest that he returned to his throne, but most likely as a Tony Na vassal, or after a substantial ransom payment. An undated inscription from this period also notes a captive with the name of Ach Chik Nab, which translates to He of Kalakmul, which would tease at a direct conflict between Kalakmul and Tony Na, but it's equally possible that this prisoner was sent from Kalakmul to aid a Western ally. During this time, records at Bonham Pak indicate that they had become a Tony Na vassal as well. By the early 8th century, Tony Na was the undisputed master of the western Maya area, capping a spectacular rise from earlier obscurity. 
Tony Na was also surprisingly durable, outlasting its rivals and remaining the last great power in the West at the end of the Classic period. But its downfall will have to wait until a later chapter. Okay, so these chapters have been a bit of a bro show so far, but now it's time to shine a light on one of my favorite Maya rulers and queens whilst using a chapter title straight from a queen song. But the queen I'm referring to is Wakchanil Ahau, better known as Lady Six Sky, the ruler of Naranjo. If you've played the game Civilization VI, you'll recognize that name because she is the in-game leader of the Maya. So who was this woman, and why is she such a big deal? Let's find out. Before we get into Wak Chanil Ahau's life, we need to back up a bit. Remember from last episode that Naranjo had been a key ally during the rise of Kalak Mul and the fall of Tikal. However, they had decided to turn away from the Kalak Mul alliance and pursue their own agenda. As a result, Karakol had conquered the city back in 631 with Kalak Mul's aid, and Naranjo went under Karakol's subjugation. However, Naranjo slowly recovered in the following decades under its new ruler, Kaakshi Chanchak. This culminated in 680 when he launched a star war against Karakol and decisively defeated them, forcing the Karakol king, Kaak Uhol Kanich II, to flee from the city. This victory was so great that Karakol went silent for the next century. What's interesting about this victory is that it isn't recorded at Naranjo, but at Karakol. Now you might be wondering why Karakol memorialized such a humiliating defeat. It's because usually when you see cities and rulers discuss their past defeats, it's so they can contrast it with a later victory, a way to say that a loss was avenged with a later victory. Unfortunately for us, the rest of the inscription can't be read, but judging from the trend of how cities recorded their defeats, we can speculate that the rest of the inscription likely recorded Karakol's retaliation. Although very circumstantial, there's pretty good evidence that Karakol did retaliate and that it was especially brutal because Naranjo's ruling dynasty is never heard from again and it's possible that most of them were exterminated or exiled. Yikes. With the old Naranjo dynasty gone, Karakol and their ally Kalak Mul were in a position to install a new dynasty at the city, one that would be favorable to Kalak Mul hegemony and hostile to Tikal. Kalak Mul was still being ruled by Yuknom Chen II, and though he was in his final years, his choice shows that even in his advanced age, he had lost none of his cunning savvy. He contacted an old friend who owed him a lot of favors, Bakla Chan Kawil of Dos Pilas. Remember, Bakla Chan Kawil had been a member of the Tikal dynasty and a claimant to their throne that Kalak Mul had backed. Now, Dos Pilas was not a great city by any means. It was dwarfed by Tikal, but that meant that it was a loyal Kalak Mul ally because their existence depended on Kalak Mul's continued support and patronage. Thus, in one last great act of cooperation between Yuknom and Bakla Chan Kawil, they selected Bakla Chan Kawil's teenage daughter, the future Wakchanil Achao, to go to Naranjo and help refound the dynasty. Not only would this new dynasty be loyal to Kalak Mul, it would also be connected to that alternate Tikal dynasty at Dos Pilas, a very inspired pick. I'd love to know the details of how all this went down. Was Wakchanil Ahau excited for this chance, or was she reluctant to be taken from her home? Regardless of how everyone felt, it would seem that she took to the role with gusto and energy. Now, she didn't just show up and declare herself queen. When she arrived in Naranjo on August 27, 682, she was arranged to be married to a local man. And for those who are wondering, when I say arrived, I mean that kind of arrived that we saw in the previous episode. So who was her husband? As it turns out, the identity of her husband is unknown, and no mentions of him are made on any monuments, although it's commonly speculated that he was a distant relation to the previous ruler to give the new dynasty some extra legitimacy. But that's okay, because I'm pretty sure that Wak Chenil Ahau was way cooler than him anyways. I do want to make it clear that she was never officially installed as the Ahau of Naranjo. Her official title was Holy Lady of Dos Pilas. However, that's not the impression you'd get from her monuments, where she takes front and center stage. On these monuments, she is shown fulfilling all the expected roles of a ruler. On Stila 24, she is shown dressed as the moon goddess with elements of the maize god, showing that she was capable of fulfilling both masculine and feminine roles. 
cartoon endings and similarly important dates would have been commemorated by her. Similar to Lady Ka'abal's Shook from the last chapter, she would have performed important rituals to conjure the power of her ancestors, which in this case would have been the same ancestors of the Tikal dynasty. Six years after her arrival, she gave birth to a son, the future king of Naranjo, Ka'aktili Chan Chak. He would officially ascend to the throne in 693 at the tender age of five, which meant that his mother would rule as his regent. With an heir in the wings, Wak Chanil Ahau turned her attention to shoring up the integrity of Naranjo's sphere of influence. One gets the impression that several Naranjo vassals may have tried to test this new queen by asserting their independence, because Wak Chanil Ahau spent the next several years campaigning in her backyard, forcing these vassals back into submission. Any hopes they had of sovereignty were to be dashed, because the queen didn't mess around. Her monuments record campaigns against ten neighboring cities in five years, Tikal among them. The most impressive was the subjugation of Ukanal, and their next two rulers would be installed under Naranjo auspices. Like all mothers with too much to do and too little time, she was clearly a force to be reckoned with. One of her monuments also refers to her by the highly reserved term Kalompte, the only time that I'm personally aware of that a Maya woman ever used that title. Her most famous monuments depict her standing on bound captives, which show that she didn't shy away from using the martial imagery of her male counterparts. Fellas, find yourself a nice lady who will lead your soldiers for the glory of the kingdom. As her son Ka'aktili Chan Chak came of age, he continued Naranjo's wars against its neighbors. His greatest victory came in 710, when he sacked and burned the city of Yasha. He would assume more and more duties of ruling Naranjo, which sadly means that his amazing mother faded into the background. Her last mention at Naranjo comes in 726. Her death is never referenced at Naranjo, but it is referenced at a monument at Dos Pilas, which mentions in passing that she died in 741. Some have interpreted this as evidence that she spent the last years of her life back at her home of Dos Pilas. Until more records are uncovered, we won't know for sure. Despite her humble origins, Wak Chanil Ahau helped get Naranjo back on its feet. When she arrived at the city, things were a mess and the dynasty was all but destroyed. Under her reign, a new dynasty at Naranjo began and the city stabilized. She worked tirelessly to retain and expand Naranjo's sphere of influence. And by all accounts, she and her son were extremely successful. It's no wonder that she's one of the most studied figures in ancient Maya history. Unfortunately, this renaissance at Naranjo was not to last, because an old enemy was back on the warpath. Now it's time to turn our attention back to the lively rivalry of Tikal and Kalakmul. Kalakmul's golden age had come at the expense of Tikal. Thanks to skillful diplomacy and military success, Kalakmul had formed a powerful anti-Tikal bloc with Naranjo, Karakol, and Dos Pilas to keep Tikal suppressed. Tikal had made efforts to cast off Kalakmul hegemony in 672, and despite success against Dos Pilas, their armies could not stave off final defeat at the hands of Kalakmul. In 679, Dos Pilas inflicted another stinging defeat on Tikal, most likely with Kalakmul aid. Despite these successes, cracks were beginning to form in the coalition. As we've already seen, Naranjo had tried to jump ship and provoked wars with Karakol. Over in Kalakmul, their great ruler, Yuknom Ch'en, died in 686. With his passing, the time was ripe for Tikal to rise again. For all of Tikal's defeats during the 7th century, they had been very lucky in one regard, and that was that Tikal's dynasty had emerged relatively unscathed. True, they did have a pretender in Dos Pilas claiming to be the true Tikal heir, but think about how many other dynasties were thrown into turmoil in the aftermath of a Star War. Tikal was very fortunate that the dynasty retained its integrity. Despite an ultimately underwhelming reign, Nun Uhol Chak survived the wars and was peacefully succeeded by his son, Hasao Chan Kawil I, in 682. His career goals were simple to restore Tikal power and to defeat Kalakmul, goals which had long eluded his predecessors. In Kalakmul, Yuknom the Great was succeeded by his heir, Yuknom Ichak-Kaak, four years into Hasao Chan Kawil's reign. Yuknom Ichak-Kaak was very likely involved in the affairs of the Kalakmul government before he officially took power, 
so he was able to hit the ground running and keep Kalakmul's vassals in check. However, Tikal was becoming harder to control, and the two cities were on an inevitable collision course. This came to a head on August 5th, 695, when Tikal forces under Chesau Chang Kawil inflicted a decisive defeat on Kalakmul, resulting in Yichak Ka'ak fleeing to La Corona. Records state that Chesau Chang Kawil brought down the flint and shield of Yichak Ka'ak. Adding to the weight of this victory was the fact that one of Kalakmul's patron deities, Yahao Man, was captured during the battle. Like many other ancient people, the Maya would bring their idols into battle, pitting the power of their gods against those of their foes. For Kalakmul, this must have been a humiliating defeat, and for Tikal, it was a turning point. At last, Tikal was back and free of Kalakmul dominance. These beautifully carved lintels, commissioned by Chasau Chan Kawil in Temple 1, immortalized the victory. In celebrating Tikal's new success, Chasau Chan Kawil reached back into Tikal's early history for the appropriate idiom, its ancient connection with the city of Teotihuacan. By now, the city of Teotihuacan was a shadow of what it had once been. Even though its imperial glories were long gone, the memory of its role in Tikal history was not. In fact, the commemoration date recorded on that lintel is exactly 256 years after the death of Spear Thrower Owl. The people of Tikal remembered their past well. In his own depictions, Chasau Chang Kawil displayed himself as a Teotihuacano warrior. Like his ancestors, he too was inaugurating a new era of Tikal's success. Despite Tikal's rising fortunes, further gains were slow to come by. Remember, Kalakmul had worked hard to assemble those alliances to check Tikal power, and even though it was beginning to fray, much of it was still effective. Despite re-establishing control over Motul de San Jose and possibly Nashtun, the cities of Naranjo, El Peru, and Dos Pilas were able to hold off advances to the east and the south. Now, these didn't completely stymie the energies of Hasao Chan Kawil because he got to work doing something no Tikal king had done in nearly a century monumental construction. Several pyramids and complexes date to his reign, and he began to build up Tikal anew. It doesn't take much imagination to think of the civic pride that these new buildings inspired. When he died around 730, Tikal was once again a great power, but still finding its footing. It would be up to his heir to see the continuation of Tikal's restoration. And let me tell you, that heir was up for the challenge. On December 8, 734, Chasau Chan Kawil's son, Yikin Chan Kawil, ascended to the Tikal throne. Chasau Chan Kawil may have been the man to throw off the Kalakmul yoke, but it would be his son that would re establish Tikal's imperial ambitions and settle old scores. Yikin Chan Kawil didn't waste any time. A stila dating from the first years of his reign celebrates a victory against Kalakmul and shows an unfortunate Kalakmul captive. Unfortunately, the name of this Kalakmul noble is damaged, so we don't know if this was a high-ranking noble or even Kalakmul's ruler. That was just the start, though. I like to imagine Yakin Chang Kawil making lists of Tikal's enemies and then slowly checking them off with a cackle as his reign progressed. Remember the cities that Hasao Chang Kawil couldn't take during his reign? They were in the crosshairs now. Lintels from Temple 4 chronicle a string of impressive victories from the years 743 and 744. In the summer of 743, Yakin Chan Kawil attacked Yasha, not to be confused with the similarly named Yasha. This city was a client of El Peru, and it forced a showdown between the king of El Peru, named Jaguar Throne, awesome name, and Yakin Chan Kawil. In the resulting battle, Tikal not only emerged triumphant, but it also captured the patron god of El Peru and brought it back to Tikal. Not even a full year later, in early 744, Tikal launched a star war against Naranjo, and judging from the victory monuments that followed, one gets the impression that Ikin Chan Kawil was out for blood. Not only did he capture Naranjo's king, Muyi Chan Chak, he also took the patron deity back to Tikal, and there's even evidence that the very throne at Naranjo itself was hauled back to the city too. For those who are curious, this king was probably the grandson of Lady Six Sky and the son of Kaaktili Chan Chak from the last chapter, but scholars aren't 100% sure on that. 
Regardless of his parentage, the last time he shows up in the historical record, he appears bound and captive on a Tikal Stila, and it's probable that he was brought back to Tikal and executed. These campaigns against El Peru and Naranjo were such a blow to the cities that their records went dark after the war for decades. These victories helped break the encirclement around Tikal once and for all, and shattered Kalakmul's anti-Tikal bloc. In the wake of these victories, Ikin Chan Kawil embarked on a massive building spree, likely aided by an influx of booty and foreign labor. Temple 4, one of the tallest Maya buildings on record, dates to his reign. Oddly, we don't know when Ikin Chan Kawil died, but when he did, sometime around 746, possibly later, he had cemented himself not only as Tikal's greatest military leader, but also its greatest builder. A possible tomb for him may have been found in Temple 73, but its surprising modesty has left others to speculate that his tomb has never been excavated. It's possible that his tomb is in the magnificent Temple 4, still waiting to be seen. Tikal's dominance would continue through the next two rulers, Ruler 28 and Yashnun Ain II, before a final decline would set in. Some of you may be wondering what was happening at Kalak Mool. In earlier times, Tikal victories had been met with fierce retaliation from Kalak Mool. Why was there no intervention from Kalak Mool during Yakin's rampages? Why didn't they come to the aid of their allies? Let's go back to Ichak Ka'ak really quick. Although records of Kalak Mool regarding his reign are frustratingly few, he appears to have kept the Kalak Mool hegemony going. His defeat by Tikal was his only major blemish. Ichak Ka'ak likely died sometime before 700 and was succeeded by Yuknom Tokkawil. Monuments at other cities show that after this event, Kalakmul retained close relationships with El Peru, Naranjo, and Dos Pilas, so it appears that even during his reign, the city was still a power to be reckoned with. Unfortunately, the next rulers were unable to stop Tikal's resurgence. Even though monuments continued to be erected at Kalakmul for the next century, its name began appearing less and less at other cities, which suggests a weakening foreign influence. There's one final gasp of Kalakmul meddling in foreign affairs, but we'll get to that in a later chapter. Internal turmoil may have played a part too. In 751, a stela by a ruler named Great Serpent bears that old bat glyph, so perhaps the Snake Dynasty was out and the Bat Dynasty was back in power. Regardless, by the middle of the 8th century, the Kalakmul Imperium was no more, and Tikal would dominate the Paten for the rest of the century. Finally, there may also be some questions about Dos Pilas. Remember, a member of the Tikal ruling family had broken off from Tikal and set up shop at Dos Pilas as a rival city. During the reign of Hasao Chan Kawil, Dos Pilas spent their time consolidating and expanding their kingdom under the leadership of Itzamna Kawil. His successor, Ruler Three, actually managed to capture the city of Sebal along with its king, Ichak Bahlam. His successor, Kawil Chan Kinich, spent most of his reign warring with neighbors and capturing lords from Motul de San Jose and Yashitlan. It's uncertain why the city became so aggressive, but it's worth keeping in mind that these wars may have been defensive and that other cities may have been contesting Dos Pilas' authority now that Kalakmul was in turmoil. Things would come to a head in 761 when Dos Pilas completely collapsed. Katwil Chan Kinich was never heard from again. Was this a conquest or a rebellion of fed up vassals? This event is frustratingly obscure, but an inscription from nearby Tamarindito refers to a flight by Katwil Chan Kinich from the city in 761. I think it's reasonable to assume that the waning power of Kalakmul left Dos Pilas exposed, and without Kalakmul's support, it was only a matter of time until their fragile authority came apart. In the vacuum left by Dos Pilas, local authority in the Patesh Patun region splintered between cities like Aguateca, Sebal, Cancuen, Aguas Calientes, and La Amelia. Some of them even continued using the Mutal glyph as Dos Pilas had done. Archaeology paints a pretty bleak picture of this region in the Lake Classic as warfare between these cities and other powers tore the region apart, but we'll explore that in our next episode. With the dissolution of Dos Pilas, Tikal's last major rival had been vanquished, and one could say that their revenge was complete. The late 8th century represents the peak of Tikal power, but as we'll see later, the 9th century would present a major challenge for the city.
For this chapter, we're going to turn our attention east to the city of Copan. When we left off at Copan way back in chapter 2, Yashka'uk Mo had arrived there and established a new dynasty in 426 CE. The new dynasty enjoyed great success and a remarkable political stability that was rare in the classic world. Being isolated in a cozy valley on the eastern periphery of the Maya world, Copan was fortunate not to get caught up in the wars that racked the rest of the great Maya cities. If you ever find yourself transported back in time to the classic Maya world, Copan seems like it would have been a lovely place to settle down. Unlike many other cities, we have a very good record of rulers thanks to this altar here, Altar Q. This altar records the first 16 rulers of the new dynasty, an almost complete dynastic record. During the early classic, the population of Copan rose steadily and the city expanded, which is epitomized by its towering acropolis, which is the result of years of building and expansion. At its height, the city likely had a population at or near 20,000 people, although by the 8th century the population was in decline because the valley was getting overpopulated and resources were getting strained. Pollen records show that the area around Copan had become deforested, and this was probably causing soil erosion. Despite this, the city remained stable and prosperous. Copan's Golden Age peaks with the reign of Washaklahun Uba Kawil, known in some sources as 18 Rabbit. Coming to the throne in 695, he was the 13th ruler of the Copan dynasty and is known for the incredible art produced under his patronage. This was the result of a steady development of stonework in the city. As I just mentioned earlier, much of the valley by this time was deforested, which meant that the wood to burn the limestone to create stucco was in short supply. In response to this, Copan sculptors began to lean less on stucco for decorative finishes and relying more on finished stone. It's why so much sculpture from Copan shows such a high degree of craftsmanship and naturalism. During his long reign, Washaklahun Uba Kawil built no less than seven stila, all exquisite examples of classic sculpture. He's also noteworthy for commissioning the hieroglyphic stairway, a new and expanded ball court, and expansions to several temples in the city core. Now, if Washaklahun Uba Kawil had died in 737, he could have passed into the afterlife knowing that he had had a peaceful, productive, and memorable reign as one of Copan's finest rulers. Unfortunately, fate would not be so kind, and Copan's isolated tranquility would soon be shattered by an insane turn of events. In April of 738, Copan was completely blindsided in an attack by the neighboring city of Kirigua and its king, Ka'ak Tilichan Yopat. Not only was the city humbled and its patron gods destroyed or desecrated, but Washaklahun Uba Kawil himself was captured and beheaded several days later. This was shocking. Kirigua had been a traditional vassal of Copan and was a far smaller city. Even at its future peak, the city never had more than a few thousand people living there. It was a far cry from the other metropolises that we've seen in these episodes. Ka'ak Tilichan Yopat had even been personally installed as king by Washaklahun 14 years earlier. For reasons that are unknown, Ka'ak Tilichan Yopat decided that being a Copan subject was for suckers and plotted a devious betrayal, or to those on Team Kirigua, a clever ruse. In fact, the language contained in the records is very telling. None of the Kirigua monuments use the term war when describing their victory, which kind of implies that there was some deceit involved. When you read about this, you get the subtle impression that this was less a military victory and more of a coup. Whatever intrigues and backroom deals allowed this to happen are lost to time. However, there is one tantalizing bit of evidence that suggests a larger conspiracy, and that is a stila at Kirigua dated to 736 that records an event linked to our favorite meddler of the Maya world, Kalakmul. This text isn't fully deciphered, but it's difficult to ignore a Kalakmul reference so close in time to such a huge event. It's possible that such plots were common in a world full of palace intrigues and real politique, but Kirigua's gamble appears to have been one of the few that were successful. This incredible event turned the area upside down. Kirigua was now the master and Copan the client. Records at Copan go completely silent for the next 17 years, and no construction can be dated to that time. A later partial inscription that may lament this period notes, no altars, no pyramids.
With Copan laid low and Kirigua ascending, Kaaktili Chan Yopat wasted no time in aggrandizing his city. If you ever visit Kirigua, you're basically walking around the town that Kaaktili Chan Yopat built. With eastern trade routes now under Kirigua's control, wealth began to pour into the city, and Kaaktili Chan Yopat put those resources to use. The Kirigua Acropolis was rebuilt on a grander scale. Huge stele in the Copan style were erected in the city center that were likely crafted by the same artists that had made Washaklahun Uba Kawil's monuments. These stele at Kirigua are among the biggest ever built by the Maya. The largest of them, Stila E, is 7.6 meters or 25 feet tall and weighs over 30 tons. Kaaktili Chan Yopat also made it a priority to legitimize his new status by commissioning monuments linking him and his ancestors with the creation of the world, no doubt creating a parallel between the creation and rebirth of Kirigua. Remember, Maya kings had links to the divine realm and were expected to access this power to intercede for their subjects, so driving this home would have been important. Kaaktili Chan Yopat finally died on July 27, 785 an almost larger-than-life figure for his city. Truly, no Maya king so decisively changed the fortunes of one city. His successor, Sky Shul, continued his building program during his reign, but only ruled for about 10 to 15 years. During the latter half of the 8th century, Copan actually mounted an impressive recovery. Their dynasty still remained intact, and a new king, Chan Kawil, succeeded to the Copan throne after the Kirigua coup. Under him and his successors, the city would eventually start building again. In fact, many important monuments, like the final version of the hieroglyphic stairway and altar Q, date to this period. That said, the city would never regain its former prestige. It was a shadow of what it had once been. Besides the political misfortunes, environmental degradation after all that deforestation and erosion was finally catching up to the city, and emigration was really starting to pick up, which was leaving the valley depopulated. We also see an alarming development during the reign of Copan's 16th ruler, Yash Pasak Chan Yopat. His monuments show him with certain nobles who perform many duties that were normally reserved for kings. This suggests that the nobility was growing in influence at the expense of the monarchy. Nothing epitomizes this better than the construction of the Popol Na, or Council House, by Yash Pasak. Lords and aristocrats were now taking an active role in the government of the city. By 780, these same lords were even building their own palaces with finishings that were rivaling the kings. Yash Pasak's final monuments are crudely carved incense burners that commemorate important dates in 802 and 805, both sad testaments to Copan's inexorable decline. So sad that I could not even find a picture of them anywhere. You'll have to use your imagination. And it's not like Kirigua was faring much better either. Their brief moment in the sun had passed, and it was facing similar problems. An interesting cartoon monument erected at Kirigua in 810 mentions Yash Pasak, but it doesn't say whether he and Kirigua's king, Jade Sky, celebrated the cartoon ending together. This odd inscription suggests that the two cities may have reconciled as both rulers struggled to retain control over events playing out in their domains. Within a few years, Kirigua went silent. Yash Pasak's tomb records a toppling of the foundation house, likely a reference to collapsing dynastic power. Copan records one more ruler, Ukit Tuk, a ruler whose reign was so fleeting that his inaugural monument was never finished. A sad ending to a long and distinguished dynasty. Some habitation at Copan persisted, but its once great population and royal lineage were no more than memories. What happened to Copan and Kirigua? Why were two of the most stable city-states in the Maya world unraveling so suddenly? As it turns out, this wasn't a local phenomenon. It was happening all over the lowlands. During this 9th century crisis, historical records ground to a halt as cities all over the lowlands were abandoned. There is a peculiar exception to this, though, and that was to the north, where cities weren't just surviving, but thriving. Let's turn our attention to the north in the next chapter. So for most of this series, we focused on the Maya lowlands, but I do want to turn our attention briefly to the north, because there was action happening there during the Classic period. 
Unfortunately, most northern sites lack the large body of records that lowland cities have, which means that the chronology of the area is poorly understood. As a result, this will probably feel much more cursory than previous chapters, so I apologize in advance if this is much more spotty than usual. This is really unfortunate because some of the most famous Maya cities are located in this area, and also because the classic period lasted longer in the north than in the lowlands. Although we don't see those classic elements as vividly embodied in the north as we do in the south, the two areas were still in contact and linked together. In fact, we noted earlier that some sites, such as Kalak Mool, had political links to northern cities like Chibanche. Sites in the Puk and Rio Beck regions, like Bakan, Ushmal, and Edzna, appear to have had links to classic centers to the south, and likely acted as intermediaries between the more northern sites. Let's take a look at the largest of these sites, Ushmal, which is located in the Puk region. Ushmal, in many ways, is the poster child of the end of the Classic period, which scholars usually refer to as the Terminal Classic. In the previous chapter, we mentioned that a crisis was engulfing the southern lowlands during the 8th century, but during that same time, Ushmal was in its golden age. The city is famous for its Puk-style architecture, which is characterized by its very ornate decoration, vaulted roofs, and fine stone veneers. I love it. Ushmal's origins aren't actually documented at the city, but in colonial Maya accounts, specifically in the Chalam Balam. This account links the establishment of the city with the arrival of the Tutul Shu family in the Puk region after a long migration. The Shu family are going to be important players in Maya history down the road, so keep that name in mind. Inscriptions at Ushmal, however, do document one ruler who left a large legacy at the city, Chan Chakaaknal Ahau. The dates of his reign aren't certain, but he appears to have ruled in the late 9th and early 10th century. He's credited with commissioning the House of the Governor and the Nunnery Quadrangle. Those are modern names, by the way. No governors or nuns actually resided there, as far as we know. This is noteworthy because his reign represents some of the last royal Maya art that was so characteristic of the classic Maya. After his reign, the city slipped into decline. Now, I don't want you thinking that Ushmal represents the lone pinnacle of classic culture in the northern Yucatan. Two sites in the far north, Ekbalam and Koba, peaked during the classic period and left an impressive legacy behind. Ekbalam is particularly interesting because unlike most northern sites, there's actually a surprisingly large corpus of written inscriptions from the site. By the way, one fun fact that I discovered about Ekbalam is that the modern name of Ekbalam is the same as its ancient name. The local Maya preserved the name of the site long after it was abandoned, which is pretty cool. Ekbalam was powerful. It was the center of a large kingdom called Talol, which seems to have reached its peak between 770 and 840. Ekbalam appears to have been governed by kings like its southern contemporaries. The best-known ruler is a lord named Ukikan Lektok, and we have a possible coronation date on May 26, 770 CE. Other records indicate that he probably ruled until about 806. He was a pretty big deal because his name shows up in 20 different monuments, several of which were erected posthumously. Looking at Ekbalam's eastern contemporary Koba, we see similar classic influences from the south. Koba's origins date all the way to the late pre-classic, but by the late classic, it really took off and grew into an influential city of 60,000 people. While we lack the rich historical records of Ekbalam, archaeologists can tell that Koba had strong contact with the southern lowlands, judging by the polychrome vessels found at the site. It may have also had dynastic connections with Ekbalam, and like Ekbalam, it appears to have governed a sizable area, and this is easily visible because Koba linked its vassals by a series of sakbeob. For those who have no idea what a sakbe is, it's a type of raised roadway that the Maya built. The longest Sakbe at Koba measures 100 kilometers and links Koba to the city of Yashuna, which was conquered by Koba during its late classic heyday. Now, no discussion of the Yucatan during the classic would be complete without a discussion of a new regional power. The city needs very little introduction because odds are you're already familiar with this city, Chichen Itza. Now, just to be clear, when I say Chichen Itza, we are talking about Old Chichen, which refers to the city built at the site during the Classic period. The more famous ruins like the Castillo, the Caracol, and the Temple of the Warriors were built later in the post-Classic, but that's not our focus today. 
Don't worry, we'll cover those in a future episode someday. Although it wasn't the powerhouse it would become in the post-classic, it was still a powerful regional center during the 9th and 10th centuries that began to expand its influence. One notable figure who is mentioned in inscriptions from this time is Kakupakal Kawil. According to records at the site, he ruled from 869 to 881. Other inscriptions from the classic also point to monarchs ruling over the city into the late classic. The rise of Chichen Itza also coincides with the decline of Ekbalam, Ushmal, and Koba at the end of the classic. Archaeologists are fairly certain that Chichen Itza even wrestled Yashuna from Koba control, although whether this was a cause or consequence of Koba's decline isn't known. By the end of the classic, Ushmal, Ekbalam, and Koba were slipping into decline for reasons that are still being debated. So why do I bring these sites up when there's such a paltry historical record? Part of the reason is that these sites are interesting on their own, but it's also because the North is going to play a big part in later Maya history, and in the next chapter, the Maya Collapse. But that's going to have to wait until our next episode. So stay tuned to find out how and why the Maya world changed so radically and so suddenly. Special thanks to my patrons listed here. You guys are the best. If you would like to join the ranks of these fine individuals and support the show, you can do so on Patreon. The link will be in the description. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Facebook. Take care and we'll see you in our next episode.